great to see you. We do have some of our number that we're missing today, and I hate that, but we have some back and some visiting, and it's a pleasure to see each one here and appreciate the, those who have led today and appreciate the providence of God that allows us to have the health and strength to be out on this Lord's Day and to worship Him and hopefully learn more about His Word. Before uh, I do get into the lesson this morning, I'd like to make mention of something, if I might. Um, you know, uh, there's been uh, some uh, suggestion recently about uh, the need for teaching or extra teaching or teaching on specific topics. I always love to hear that kind of talk. <laughs> you know, what that suggests to me is people are really interested in what the Bible says. And that's a great thing. And uh, I have that same attitude, I hope. So I thought I might uh, try to restoke something that we uh, introduced some time back. We have in the back a couple of shoe boxes. Maybe they need to be refurbished a little bit. Some of them looking sort of rough, but somebody did a good job with those. They've been a bit abused. But uh, one of them says topics. And it may be that uh, you have a particular topic in mind that you'd like to hear discussed here, maybe a question that you have. And I thought what we could do, and the idea is, <clears throat> maybe I'll leave some of these cards back there, and you can write on the card, you know, a topic or a question that you have that you'd like to hear discussed in a lesson. And uh, we'll do our best, I'm not suggesting I know all the answers, but uh, we'll do our best to try to address that topic in a biblical way. Uh, I, I'd, I would like for you, if you would, when you drop it in, to put your name on the bottom, only because if I have a question about what you've asked about, I can make sure I get it right. And also, it might help if I know somebody's asked a question, they're going to be out of town, I'll try not to address that while they're gone. But I, I <clears throat> will uh, try to put these, these uh, cards on the back. And if that's an interest to you, if you want to make use of that, uh, I'd be glad for you to do so. So we'll try to... Uh, uh, try to see if we might be helpful in addressing some questions that are on your mind. One question that uh, was suggested a while back that we've been addressing for some time is the question of leadership of the local church. <clears throat> and uh, our approach to this study has been a little bit different, at least for me. I mean, it's not different to the world. But um, my approach this time was not to go to immediately 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and look at those qualities, but we started off by spending a good bit of time in this study on the terms that God uses to describe the office of a, um, <clears throat> of a shepherd or of an overseer or of an elder. We looked at that idea of a shepherd from a Bible point of view, what it means to be a good shepherd and the characteristics as we see them in Christ of a good shepherd and how that might apply to uh, the work of an elder. We looked at uh, the idea of an overseer. What really does that entail? Uh, how far do we take that? There are limits, and yet it has an authority to it, the idea of one who submits to another, the direction that would be given there within the limits of God's word. Uh, I think there's a value in that because in, in understanding who an elder is, and that's really what this is about, I said early on, I'll say it periodically. This, is, this study is not an attempt to ramrod anything uh, in reference to the church here. But the church here has been here a long time. And, uh, and you know, elders are needed. They're needed in this church and every church if they're a plurality of men qualified. I hope at the end of this study, having thought about these things afresh, that uh, we will come to a decision about whether or not the church will have to decide that whether or not we have a plurality of men at this time qualified. If not, keep on working at it. Uh, but, uh, but we have a, it's a very practical study uh, and something that I trust will be of use. We introduced uh, <clears throat> recently the concept of elders. That's another one of those terms used interchangeably, and yet they each have a different emphasis when it comes to this idea of those who are set over a local church by the plan of God the presbyteros. That word carries with it the idea of age, uh, of comparative age. It doesn't suggest somebody who has to be ancient, 
but somebody older than. Uh, and one thing that we noticed in the, the lesson previously uh, is that when it comes to the idea of elders, that you have a formal use of that word and maybe what we call an informal use of that word. Um, when uh, in Romans chapter 9, you know, uh, when it came to Esau and Jacob, that the elder would serve the younger. He's not talking about someone who's been appointed to a position. He's just talking about an older brother. But even in that language, the idea is that the older brother generally had privilege over the younger in reference to the family, uh, inheritance, and so on. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, we looked at this last time as well. Paul said, don't rebuke an elder, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Oh, I'm sorry, that's 1 Timothy 5 and verse 2. That's what I'm thinking about. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. That's what I meant to say. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. He's not talking there about the office of an elder. He's just talking about older people. There's a certain way you treat older men, and he goes on to talk about older women. You don't just talk to an older man or an older woman just any way. You talk to her like you talk to your father or your mother. Be careful about the language you use and the tone you use, and all that is true. But even there, <clears throat> the idea is that an older person has a certain position of respect that ought to be recognized. And if it's not, there's something wrong with that spiritually. But there is an official use of that word. You know, when you read in the Old Testament about the elders of Israel, and even as they are carried over in the New Testament, as you read about the days of Christ, he would tell his disciples that the elders are going to call me up, they're going to put me on trial, they're going to put me to death. He's talking about that Sanhedrin. Here are those who are given an official position. You also read, interestingly enough, that word presbyteros in Revelation several times, Revelation 4 and 5 and throughout the book, about uh, uh, there being a, uh, in the uh, picture of the, the throne scene of God, you have 24 elders. You have the cherubim, uh, you have the, uh, the angels, and then you have these 24 elders that are given a position, it seems, of authority. I believe they represent human beings in the realm beyond. And we suggested, for whatever's worth last time, it suggests to us that perhaps just like with the angels, there's a hierarchy. We read about the archangel. There's a lot we don't know about that hierarchy. But we do know that there are angels that are in authority over other angels. And maybe that suggests the idea of the same would be true about human beings in that realm beyond. We don't know much about that. But we do have this idea of elders, even in the realm beyond. But our study is about elders for a local church. Qualified men who are appointed to rule, to lead, to shepherd the flock. And we read about the qualities necessary to be an elder over in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And in, uh, in verse 1, beginning as an example, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 1, it is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his house, ruleth well, I should say, his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We find a similar list, not identical in terms of the exact words that are used, but in Titus chapter 1, a similar list. Titus 1, and beginning there in verse 5, For this cause, Paul writes, I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, in every city as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, 
the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding faith and the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. There's a need for elders, a need for shepherds. And here are these qualities that Paul says by which you can define those who ought to be in that position. You know, we, we, I think we mentioned this before. I can't remember. But, and I'm not trying to pick on this, but sometimes we talk about the qualifications for an elder. That's not a bad term. But it might lead to a bad concept or a bad idea. Um, you know, we're not talking here, of course, about things that are necessary to get the office. <laughs> we're talking about things that are necessary to hold the office. And in that sense, they're not just qualifications to get the job, as it were. They're the qualities necessary to hold the job. I believe that's true. And I believe if a man ceases to be these things, he ceases to be qualified for the job. Um, you know, when I learned how to drive many years ago, you took the driver's test, you had to study that book. So we studied our driver's manual. I could probably online now. They even have books anymore. You study the driver's uh, manual there so that you can go down and take the test and then forget everything you learned. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how people try? I mean, they get a license. They, they learned it to get the license, never thought about it again. Of course, that doesn't work with these qualities, does it? So we come to that point where we want to, to know more about what are the qualities that an elder must have. And we have broken these qualities down in terms of categories. Mention this also again quickly. <clears throat> um, sometimes people will try to discount Titus 1 and 2 Timothy 3, or 1 Timothy 3, because they say, well, you know, I mean, they don't actually match up, so they can't really be that important. I mean, otherwise, Paul would have given a list, here are 10 things, here are 10 things, and they'd be identical. Well, I don't think that's quite fair. Because when you look at these two lists, though it's true, some of the words are different. The concepts are the same. It all comes back to the same points. Though he may use a different word, or he may use two terms here and one term here, really it's not a different message. That's the point. It's not like he says over here, the man must have a, be married, have a family, and over here he says, well, he might be a bachelor. That's not the idea. The lists there, though they're not identical, in terms of the words, they certainly are matching in thought. So we've tried to uh, group these terms together uh, and uh, to uh, put them under topics. And we've suggested that several of these relate to a man's reputation. We looked at this earlier. We're just going to notice it briefly. But a man ought to be a, to be a shepherd. He needs to be a man of reputation. Uh, he is to be a man upon whom uh, one cannot lay hold upon him to charge him, that is. Just like in 1 Timothy chapter 6, when Paul wrote to Timothy, not an elder, but as a teacher of God's word, uh, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 14, he said, that uh, thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, same word, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy, you're going to have to practice what you preach. You can't be over here talking about God's word and then somebody be able to lay a charge on you of the same thing. Same is true about the elders. They're going to have to practice what they stand for. They ought to be also blameless. A separate word, translated the same way in my Bible, but the same concept and a different word, the idea again of someone who cannot be called into account justly, rightly. You know, there are people who will charge you with all kinds of things if you're a Christian. And they will accuse you of things. Paul said, don't be too concerned. Uh, I'm sorry. Peter was the one in 1 Peter chapter 4 who made the point. Don't be ashamed of being accused of doing right. Now be ashamed if you've been accused of a crime. 
But he said, if any man uh, be accused of being a Christian <laughs> or called into account for that name, take, take pleasure in that. So, blameless in terms of things that are blameworthy. Finally, I think the idea of being of good report also deals with one's reputation. Here is someone who has a good name among those outside the church. I may have told you this before, I don't know, but I, I, I well remember. Um, when I lived in West Virginia, we had a situation one time where a member of the church there was involved in immorality, um, a rather grotesque immorality. And we didn't know it. You know how we found out? Somebody in the community told us. Well, that, that hurt. That was a kick in the teeth. When somebody in the community says, who was connected with the family there, said, well, you know, she's uh, running around with, wow. <laughs> that was a day you don't forget. Well, the point I'm making is, you know, folks in the world may know a lot more about some of our folks than we do. <laughs> or maybe they know it before we do. Well, here's an elder. But he's got to be the kind of man that, that folks in the world who have respect for right, respect. That's the kind of man that would be appointed to this work. Uh, but he's got to be a man of character. And we said that last time. You know, a, a man of character. It's got to be real with this individual. He is holy. It's a great word, to be undefiled. If we have any question about what it means to be holy, we suggested we could look over in a passage like Ephesians chapter 4. The book of Ephesians has a lot to say about the responsibility of being a Christian. And what Paul wrote to those brethren is, he said, to be a child of God, to be in Christ, is to have all the spiritual blessings, but it calls on us to be a new man. And again, lest we be mistaken about what that means, he goes into some great detail in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 about how that, that has to do with our honesty, it has to do with how we handle our temper, how we handle our speech, how we handle our attitude toward other people, how we handle uh, the lust and desires of the flesh, and so on. You got to be a new man. And this fellow to be selected a shepherd, of course, has to be an elder, has to be a new man. He is to be just. He has to be committed to a standard of right. We looked last time at uh, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 21, do all things without partiality. It's not about who's involved, it's about what's right. That's what counts. We look back at an interesting passage to me at least in, in uh, Exodus chapter 23 when Moses told Israel, let me tell you how you judge people. You don't judge them because of how rich they are or how poor they are or they're your enemy or your friend, you judge them on the basis of what's right. And that's exactly the way a shepherd's got to do his job. And we can all imagine the disaster if you have an eldership that uh, maybe handles this situation different because this is my kinfolk, but over here we're going to handle it another way. All kind of problems with that. If you appoint a man a shepherd, he has to be the kind of person who can be objective about things. You know, you've seen that in, in you guys, a lot of you guys, your kids are in, in athletics. You've seen the guy who coaches his son. Um, and there are two ways, or three ways that can go. And two of them are bad, and you all know what they are. You know, there's the guy that uh, is uh, so hard on his son you know, that he just grinds him into the ground because he wants him to do everything right, he'll be much harder on him than he will be the other kids. That's not really fair, is it? On the other hand, you got the guy, and he's, uh, his son's going to play whether he's good enough to play or not. That's not good either. Hopefully in the middle you got somebody who's fair, even with their own, own folks involved in it. I think that's exactly the spirit that's demanded of a shepherd dealing with the church. Uh, another aspect of character that I don't think we got to last time was the matter of patience. That word patience, epiketus, is defined by Mr. Vines as gentleness. He, um, he says that which is fitting or equitable or fair or moderate, forbearing. It expresses that considerateness 
that looks humanely and reasonably at the facts of the case. Under the noun form, he adds fairness or sweet reasonableness. It's somebody who's not just looking at the letter of the law. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting we fudge the law. But they are considerate of circumstances, and they deal with people in that way. You know, in, in dealing with your children, you know, there are times when they're wrong, and you can't praise them for being wrong, but you also understand the circumstances that led to that, and you know that this is not an act of rebellion so much as it is an act of childish judgment. I'm just saying, in dealing with our children, all of us understand that we have to use judgment and how to deal with situations. That's what an elder's got to have. He's got to have that, that spirit that is able to, to be understanding, to be reasonable, to use gentleness when that's called for. <clears throat> Jameson Fawcett and Brown writing about this passage offer a thought that I think... Uh, makes you a little uncomfortable, when the, but and yet I think it has a kernel of truth. They say that considerateness for others, not urging one's own rights to the uttermost, but waving apart, and thereby rect rectifying the injustices of justice. The archetype of this grace is God who presses not the strictness of his law against us as we deserve. And then he points to Psalm 130, and Psalm 130 makes the point. Uh, if you turn over there with me, you know, what if God were to call in the bill in full measure? Where would we stand? What hope would we have without the grace of God? If thou, Lord, verse 3 of Psalm 130, if thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I'm not suggesting that uh, we can fudge the numbers and just say, oh, well, God will cover it. What I'm saying is all of us are grateful that God is that parent who doesn't give up on us on the first sign of problems. But God loves us and he's going to work with us as long as he can. I think about it in reference to John 8. There's a story in John chapter 8 that we all remember about a woman that was brought to Jesus and the accuser said she was taken in adultery in the very act. Well, suppose they weren't lying about that. What they expected him to do was either to, to uh, commend the law of Moses that she might be stoned to death, that's what happened to adulterers under the law of Moses, or that he just renounced Moses. They thought either way, whatever he says, we got it. And the Lord, you remember, when he was brought with this loud, raucous crowd, uh, he just uh, stooped down and wrote on the ground. We don't know what he wrote. But they kept on and kept on until finally he, he rose up and he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, let him that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And then he just went back to writing on the ground. And by the time he looked up again, they were all gone. Which tells you a lot. There was a lot rotten going on here. And I, you know, I've speculated about it. I don't know that I can prove it. I expect this one was set up. I expect this was all an effort to try. But it doesn't mean that she wasn't guilty. But what's, what we are struck by is at the end of that story, of course, the Lord asked, does no man accuse you? And she said, no. And then he said, neither do I accuse you. And then he said, go thy way and sin no more. Uh, not condemn you is the word I meant to use there. Does no man condemn you? No, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go thy way and sin no more. Jesus did not condemn this woman to death because he knew the whole thing was rotten. But neither did he ignore or condone her sin. You know, there's a time for judgment. There's a time when, when I deal with our children or dealing with, with our brethren. Or as a shepherd dealing with a sheep, you're going to have to decide how to handle situations where wrong may be involved. But there's a time when you've got to use a hammer and there's a time when you don't. And that's the judgment that, that patience uh, describes. 
Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Let your gracious attitude be known to all people. The Lord is near. It describes somebody who's not looking for a reason to condemn somebody. They're looking for a way to help them. And whatever will help them, really help them. Ignoring sin won't help. But finding a way to help somebody. You know, it's easy to just write them off. I, I may have shared this with you before. There's a great story about Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. There was a lot of desertion uh, on the northern side, even, during the Civil War. And the punishment for desertion was execution. But over and over again, as those uh, papers would cross his desk, he would... Uh, uh, he would uh, uh, he would uh, uh, ex the execution and, uh, and not allow that to happen. He would cancel the, the firing squad. And somebody asked him, why do you do that? And he said, well, I think the poorest use of a soldier is to shoot him. You know, I thought that's a pretty good point. Uh, you know, what he did was wrong. But I think there's still hope for this guy. I think we can still use this guy. We can't use him if we put him in the ground. So that's, I think, the essence of this word. Patience, patience. It's not a call to compromise. It's a call to compassion. Uh, there's a passage over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 I want to look at. You know, when I was uh, trying to learn how to preach, and I'm still learning, I went to work with a guy, and I, he's a pretty strong fellow, pretty stout in his faith and his conviction and his <coughs> work. But one of the lessons he taught the young fellows that worked with him was that you need to understand the balance between two passages in 2 Timothy. I think young preachers generally, they remember 2 Timothy 4. <laughs> 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. And they ought to remember it. We ought to remember it. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But he said, they will, after their own lust, heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, they'll be turned away from the truth and turned to fables. Therefore, he says, you've got to do the work of an evangelist. That's right. But in the same letter, just a few paragraphs earlier, in the second chapter, and in verse 24, Paul wrote this to the same man. He said, the servant of the Lord must not strive. The word there for strive is a word which suggests the idea of a, of a fight, of a wrangle. I... I say this with shame, but I know and especially early, and I hope I've, I've learned a little better, do a little better, especially early on in my zeal as a Christian, I think there were times when conflicts with others became fights, not fist fights, but wrangling kind of fights in which I was trying to win instead of trying to, really trying to help somebody. I, I thought I was trying to help them. But looking back, I think it was too much me and that's not, that ain't, that's not going to make it. Paul said, when you're fighting the good fight of faith, you can't fight like that. You can't strive. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, here's our word, gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they might, he says, be recovered, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. These folks are in the clutches of the devil, and it's not about winning, and it's not about getting them told. It's about trying to get them out of that mess with the power of God and bring them back where they ought to be. And if a preacher or a teacher or an elder, anybody, any of us, if we forget that, then we've forgotten who we're working for. I say that to me as much as anybody else. The shepherd's got to always keep in mind what he's doing. He's the steward. 
Isn't that what Paul said? And these are the Lord's sheep he's looking over. And uh, that's, that's an essential part of, uh, of understanding his work. Okay. Somehow we've run out of time. So I will stop there and we'll try to pick this up next time. I invite you to come back and be with us. If you're here this morning and you're not one of the Lord's sheep, you're not washed in the blood, you've not been baptized into Christ, you're not serving Him, why not make a change today? Why not today become a child of God? Maybe you're here as one who is a child of God, but your, your life is really not what it ought to be. You feel that distance between you and God, and you understand that it's not God that's moved away from you. You know, it's the other way around. I've got to come back to Him. And if there's some way we can help you to do that, we'd love to. The Lord longs to see you and, re and receive you. And if we can help you, let us know how. As Chris leads us in song, will you come while we stand and sing?